Good morning, everybody. Good, morning. Good to be here with you all. We're going to excuse the kids for Children's Church. So uh, if you're a kid, go ahead and stand up and head towards the back. And as they're heading out, let's pray for them. Father, we pray for our kids. We pray in Jesus' name that they would encounter you and be changed by you and be little lights in all of the dark places that their feet take them, school and playgrounds and all of those places where they can represent you. Father, we praise you. You're good. Amen. All right. You know, uh, when I was first getting into ministry back in the day, 10 years ago, I, uh, I felt really insecure, and uh, understandably so, because I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, <laughs> I just didn't, I didn't know. Uh, all I knew is that Jesus had radically transformed my life, and I wanted to see that exact same radical transformation happen in the lives of others. But in many cases, these inadequacies that I was feeling turned into fears. And uh, this is going to sound strange to some of you in light of the places that you guys know that I travel. Uh, but uh, some of my biggest fears in all of my ministry had nothing to do to, with traveling to some dangerous country. It had everything to do with things like hospital visits. I just really got freaked out by hospital visits, if you can believe that. Uh, like, I don't know, something about the, the, the fact that someone's going through the worst moment of their life, probably. Sometimes it's a good moment when you're out of hospital, I guess. But, like, we just had a good moment out of hospital. But, like, <laughs> yeah. But, uh, it, but like, some, some mixture of that and the smell and the thought of blood. It just, like, I just, hospital visits were just not something that I ever wanted to do. Um, and... <laughs> Just for clarity, like I, I would have rather spent the night in a tent in the middle of a hyena-infested African village than go and visit somebody in the hospital. <laughs> so anyway, like that's just kind of me. Um, I'm, I, I, I was told once by a governing board of pastors that I would make a really bad pastor, and uh, maybe they're right, I don't know. Uh, that's a joke. It's okay to laugh at that. <laughs> I, I, they really did say that, but I don't feel insecure about it anymore. Anyway, uh, I remember being at this pastor's training, and they were going around, like, just talking about ministry and stuff like that, and it got to the point where I was able to ask a question, and so I just asked a question to the whole group. I was like, how, how what do you even say to somebody at a hospital when they're having the worst day of their life? And... I think that the, the, the leaders of the seminar that I was in were just so dumbfounded by the incredible simplicity of my question that they were like, they just, they were totally silent. And it ended up being a middle-aged pastor from the audience kind of answered my question. He said, you know, I find that sometimes all that's really needed is for someone to show up. Sometimes you just need be there. And uh, those words have stuck with me ever since. Uh, and I've found them to be true. Uh, sometimes the most important thing is to just be. You, you don't have to coach someone through it. You don't have to have all the right words. You don't have to, you don't have to like, fix their problem for them. And uh, there is a time, don't get me wrong, there is a time for coaching people through their problems and helping facilitate fixing things. And, but uh, those are all Jesus' things to do. But sometimes it's just enough to be there. And uh, this week we're going to be continuing our series on finding your opportunity by taking a look at this ministry of just being there, just showing up. So uh, we're going to be looking at a guy named Epaphroditus. And if that name seems unfamiliar to you, that's no big deal, because he's a very minor character in the Bible. He only shows up in a few verses here, in the, well, two verses to be specific, and both of them are in the book of Philippians. So uh, we, I, I had the foresight to put the, the words on the screen for you this time, <laughs> but if you would like to flip there in your Bible, we're going to be in Philippians chapter 2. Um, I just want to set the scene for you really quick. So the Apostle Paul went on three missionary journeys during his ministry. During his second missionary journey, he's traveling across what is modern-day Turkey. And uh, he's traveling and going to different places and preaching God's word, and people are deciding to follow Jesus and this and that. And then he gets to this place 
uh, called Asia, and I'm not talking about the continent, I'm talking about a region in what is now modern day Turkey. It takes up like half of modern day Turkey. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit prevented him from going south into Asia, and then he's like, okay, well maybe I should go north to, I believe it's Bithynia or something like that, and then this, it says the spirit of Jesus prevented him from going north into Bithynia, so instead he goes and he has this dream at night. It, might, it says a vision at night. I don't know if it was a dream or if it was a daytime vision, I don't know, whatever. It was at night, and it was of a Macedonian man, and Macedonia is modern-day Greece, and in this dream, this Macedonian man is calling out to Paul saying, hey, come, come to Macedonia. So Paul decides that's a, a, a message from the Lord, and he's headed to Macedonia. So he crosses one of the little seas on the, around the Mediterranean Sea, I think it was like the Ionian or the Aegean Sea, between Turkey and Greece, and he gets to Greece, and in Greece there's a place called Philippi, which is a Roman, it's a Roman... Uh, Basically, like they would retire veterans to this place. It, it, they had planted this city to repopulate it, and there was a lot of military veterans living in this place. And Paul begins to preach. And this all goes down in Acts chapter 16. And you can read it for yourself there. But in Acts chapter 16, Paul preaches to a woman named Lydia. Uh, I'm sure many of you have heard the story of Lydia and how she, was a, she dyed things purple and... Uh, she decides to follow Jesus, and she has a really cool legacy because of this guy named Timothy. And then there's also this epic moment where Paul and Silas are preaching, and they get thrown into prison, and then it's midnight one night, and they're worshiping God, and, and the ch there's an earthquake, and all the chains fall off, and they're able to escape, and, and the jailer sees that they escaped, and they're like, oh no, I'm going to kill myself because all, these, all my prisoners escaped, and I don't want to get tortured to death. And instead, they're like, don't kill yourself, we're right here. And this Philippian jailer decides to follow Jesus, he, him and his whole household. It's really an epic story. And so this church gets planted in Philippi. So all of this goes down in 52 AD, not 80 AD. Um, 52 AD. Ten years later, we think Paul is in prison in Rome. We don't know if he's for sure in prison in Rome, but we think he's in prison in Rome. And the church at Philippi says, hey, we want to send a care package to Paul in Rome while he's in prison. And this guy named Epaphroditus says, Okay, I'll take it. And Epaphroditus ventures, if, if Paul is in Rome, we think he's in Rome, 800 miles. Now that's a long way today. But like, back then, a very long way. 800 miles to find his way to Paul in Rome. And here's what we read about Epaphroditus. Meanwhile, uh, beginning in verse 25, chapter 225. Meanwhile, I thought I should send Epaphroditus back to you. He is a true brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, and he was your messenger to help me in my need. I'm sending him because he has been longing to see you, and he was very distressed that you heard he was ill, and he certainly was ill. In fact, he almost died, but God had mercy on him and also on me so that I would not have one sorrow after another. So I am all the more anxious to send him back to you, for I know you will be glad to see him, and then I will not be so worried about you. Welcome him in the Lord's love and with great joy, and give him the honor that people like him deserve, for he risked his life for the work of Christ, and he was at the point of death while doing for me what you couldn't do from far away. So here's what went down. Paul is writing this letter back to the church at Philippi, basically saying, hey guys, thanks for the gift, and I'm going to send you guys back Epaphroditus. And Epaphroditus has been here with me, serving me and helping me in my time of need. He was doing for me what you guys couldn't do from really far away. And uh, I love this story of Epaphroditus because it relates so well to our theme of finding your opportunity because Epaphroditus did just that. He found his opportunity by showing up and serving Paul. 
I wish we knew more about Epaphroditus because he seems like kind of a cool dude. What, some kind of dude who, like, he, he would have been totally nameless. Just think about this. Like, he would have just been one of the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of, of Christian etc. out there who are just nobodies who just follow Jesus their whole lives. But the reason he shows up in the scriptures is not because he planted a church somewhere. It's not because he freed all the people in, in Israel from, you know, he did, it's not because he did some kind of crazy thing. The reason Epaphroditus shows up in the biblical narrative is because he decided to show up and serve. Pretty powerful, I think. It, it's, this guy's really cool. And <laughs> I, I love the fact that, so I really wish we did have more information about him, but I love the fact that we don't have that much information about him. Because it means that people like you and me can relate with him a little bit better that way, I think. Mm. He's just a regular guy. You know, during this series, we've been hearing a lot about, like, the big names in, Christi in, in, in Christian history, and biblical history. Uh, three weeks ago, we heard about e Esther, and uh, Esther is a powerful story of, uh, of how God used a, a woman in, in a particular time, in a, a particular place for such a time as this, to, to save all, Israel, all of the Jewish people in Persia from, from desolation. That's, it's an amazing, powerful story. And then the next week, we heard about about David and David, we could talk about David forever. They talk about David forever in the Bible, two whole books. Like, like we, lots and lots of information about David and David's like the king that every other king in Israel is compared to. And, and then last week we heard about Ezra and Nehemiah and these guys did powerful things in the history of God's people. And we can learn a lot from them about finding our opportunity. But also, in the same breath, I love that we can include the story of this guy named Epaphroditus. Praise God that there's a place for the, for the Epaphroditus in the same Bible as there's a place for the Davids and the Ezra's and the Nehemiah's and the Esther's. Because I don't know about you guys, but I'm probably never going to lead the United States, me. Just probably not going to happen. And uh, I'm probably never going to end a genocide of an entire people group. I, that would be awesome, but probably, like, well, it wouldn't be awesome that they're going through genocide, but it would be awesome to bring it to an end, just for clarity. And uh, I'm probably never going to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem, and I'm probably never going to, but, but I absolutely, just like all of you, will find myself in places and moments where I can show up for somebody. Ah, I love that. Absolutely. You know, I, uh, this last summer when I was preaching a sermon up here, I told you guys about a neighbor of mine named Galen. And Galen's a really cool dude. Uh, he's a Canadian uh, who is living in Colorado. And we got to talking. He's, just, he's, he's like a literal neighbor of mine. And we got to talking. And one thing led to another, and I was, I was able to share the gospel with him in this conversation that we were having this last summer at like a neighborhood picnic. Like our, our neighbors are so nice, it makes it really easy to share the good news of Jesus with them because they're just always out and talking and really cool people. Anyway, so we're having a conversation and zoom forward to December. And in December, Galen sees me outside and he's like, hey bro, it's my birthday coming up. I would love for you and Taylor to come hang out. And I was like, that would be awesome. We would love to do that. He said, yeah, I really wanted to invite you because that conversation we had this year was one of the most significant conversations I had all year long. Hmm. Now, here's the reason I tell you that. Any of you listening to that conversation from a third party perspective would have said that's an incredibly ordinary conversation that I could have had with somebody. Like you thinking I could have had it, it with somebody. Right. It wasn't special, it wasn't unique, it wasn't profound, it was just, I was just trying to tell him about this guy that I love. <laughs> I think that there's something to this ministry of just showing up. Like that, that happened just at a neighborhood get-together. It wasn't some organized thing. It was just a neighborhood get-together. Just this last week, one of the strangest, thing that, strangest things that's ever happened to me happened to me in the United States. So 
uh, Taylor is bringing groceries home, and there's also the baby in the car, and so she's like, hey, can you meet me in the garage and help me bring stuff in? And I said, yes, of course. So Taylor pulls the car into the garage as I'm walking out, and this black car pulls up in front of our house right after she pulls into our garage. And I'm like, oh, that's kind of strange. Just like, you know, situational awareness, have your eyes out for what might be going on here. And um, I'm like, but there's a lot of workers that are like redoing our roofs and, and stuff like that in the, in the housing development that I'm in. And so I was like, think nothing of it. 10 seconds later, this woman is walking up to our house, up our driveway, into our garage. And I'm like, oh, time to get between my wife and the baby and this stranger. And so I walk up and I'm like, hey, how are you doing? And uh, in a broken English, heavy Turkish accent, she asks if she can charge her phone. And I say, sure, absolutely, no problem. Taylor and I had been praying that the Lord would open up doors and opportunities for us to share, the, share his love with people because we're really shy and awkward. And so if people come to us, it's a lot easier than us having to go to them. <laughs> and uh, so I was like, hey, God's answering our prayer, so I need to, I need to make the most of this opportunity. So uh, we plug her phone in, and I invite her inside, and she doesn't want to be inside because there's a dog inside and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, we hang out outside. And we're just chatting. And over the course of our conversation, I, I learn where she's from and what she's doing here and, and why she's in my neighborhood. And, and I also learn uh, that she's a Muslim. And, I, and I'm like, oh, really? What do you, got, what do you think about Jesus? I, I know, that's, that's like really <laughs> bold, right? But I, I have like 10 minutes with this woman, so I'm going to get right to it. So I'm like, what do you think about you? Well, I think it's the same thing. And I'm like, well, I don't know. I, I, I think we believe a, a little bit different. I shared my testimony about how Jesus has, has changed my life. Just real short, like easy to understand testimony. And she sat there and smiled and then changed the subject. And that was okay. But she was literally captive audience because I had her phone. Um, <laughs> I, it wasn't a special, it wasn't a crazy out of the ordinary moment. I didn't even have to look for the moment. The moment happened to me. It was just a, it was a moment where I just showed up and God moved. There's something to this ministry of showing up. I've flown through Turkey on my way to Africa a bunch of times and never had that high quality of a conversation with a Turkish person as what happened to me right in front of my house. Crazy. <laughs> These are Epaphroditus-style moments. Nothing special, just showing up, being present and helping in a time of need. You know, in the early parts of my ministry, I thought that doing ministry meant having an event or having a gathering, or in order for me to do ministry, I had to be standing in front of a group of people and like preaching or something. But as time has passed, what I've realized is that the vast majority of ministry has nothing to do with special events and, and standing up in front of a group of people and preaching to them. The vast majority of ministry has everything to do with these like one-off conversations that you didn't know were going to happen in your day, but they happened in your day. And I'm not saying that gathering together on a Sunday morning is a bad thing. Ministry absolutely happens. Uh, wouldn't you say that just being together with other believers is like awesome? I, I love being here with all of you guys. It's great. And, and does ministry happen at big events like our picnic? 100% ministry happens at those places. But the problem is when we start thinking that ministry is only an event or a, or, or a big gathering instead of just a conversation, that can happen in your ordinary, everyday mo moments of life. If you look at the life of Jesus, he does both. There's big moments like where he preaches to 4,000 and 5,000 people and, and like big, massive crowds. But numerically speaking, the stories that we see in the Bible are far more commonly about Jesus hanging out with one or two, or three, or five. Not these big, massive groups. Just think about it. Like the woman at the well, or, or the, 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 the blind man, or, uh, 
uh, or when he goes up on the Mount of Transfiguration, there's just the three guys with him. Or, or I mean, uh, like we could go story after Jairus' daughter and, or, or the woman with the blood flow. Or like it's these little moments of one-on-one ministry. And the reason that those moments of ministry happened is because Jesus was there. Because he just showed up. If we're going to learn from Jesus' example, we, don't, we shouldn't just be practicing Epaphroditus-style ministry, we should be emphasizing it. I hope that what you're hearing me say today is that your ministry as an everyday, ordinary human being is not just essential, but incredibly meaningful. The impact that you can have in your day-to-day life, I guarantee you, okay, just think about your personal story really quickly, the reasons that you have decided to follow Jesus. For how many of you is the top five most significant reasons, a, a large percentage of the top five most significant reasons that you follow Jesus because of an individual or a specific conversation rather than someone like me standing up in front of you on a Sunday morning? I mean, my story is compiled mostly of people, just one-on-one conversations, and very few of big events. Your ministry is so powerful and profound and important if we're just willing to show up. People, when they come on mission trips with me, are always expecting like these big, profound moments, like these, like epic, like we preach to 10,000 or something, you know, like these epic moments, and I'm always like, no, 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 no. Your minute, your impact on this trip will be measured in the little moments that you share with people that change their lives forever. You know what mission trips really are? They're just a collection of little moments like that. Right now, as we speak, there are teams that we support all around the world who are advancing the gospel in the most dangerous places on planet Earth through this method, through Epaphroditus' method, through the just show up and be there method. There is a woman who was praying for sick people in her neighborhood in South Asia and a woman was healed in the name of Jesus, just healed. And they met yesterday to have coffee, well, tea. They had tea and chatted about what had happened about this Jesus guy. This Muslim woman heard the good news of Jesus because this other woman just decided to be present and pray for sick people. Another man in the same area of the world, was walking through his neighborhood, intentionally praying. He's just praying for his neighbors as he is walking through his neighborhood, and he sees a guy, and he starts a conversation, and now they regularly meet every week and go on a walk and talk about spiritual things. And you never know what might happen. That guy might soon decide to follow Jesus. I've, uh, I've told you guys this before, but in the most dangerous country on planet Earth to be a Christian... The gospel is advancing this way. People show up, they love someone, they hear the good news, and people are responding. I I mean, I could go on and on and tell you story after story after story. It's not the big name preachers, it's not the Billy Grahams of the world who are leading the most unreached to Jesus. It's the all of us of the world who are leading them to Jesus. The ordinaries, the not specials, the ones that nobody's going to write a book about, the ones that, like, you're here today and gone tomorrow, passing mist, and as soon as your kids die, you're going to be forgotten. Like, the, the nobodies, the et cetera's, the us, we are the ones making the biggest impact on planet Earth when we just decide to show up. I think we make ministry too complicated. We set it up as programs and events and this and that, and those things are not bad, but man, you have 
of profound impact when you just show up in your ordinary life. I fear that one of the major reasons that many of us never step into ministry is because we think that it needs to look like this big thing. When in reality, it doesn't really need to look like anything in particular. It just needs to look like Jesus. And what Jesus did was he just was like, hey man, what's your name? (laughs) Let's talk. Let's engage. Let's just, just in his everyday life. Hopefully you're seeing that some big event and this kind of, it's not necessary. It's awesome when we are able to pull those things off, but it's not necessary. You can just do this in your everyday life. So, uh, as an emphasis to this, I just remind you of what James says about true, true religion in the end of chapter one. He says, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Half of James' definition of true religion is just showing up. So, how do we do it? Well, step one. I have three steps for you. I never, I'm not really a three-step guy, but I have three steps for you. Step one, decide right now if you want to be used by God in your ordinary moments of life. Because here's the thing. I can preach this sermon to you, and you can be like, oh, that's a true thing, and then you have an opportunity to, to engage this, and instead of the woman driving up in the car, and she gets out of the car and starts walking to your house, and you're like, oh my gosh, uh, what's happening here? Instead of thinking, oh, this is God answering my prayer that I would be able to be a part of it, you're like, this is a weirdo freak who needs to get off my property, right? <laughs> so, like, we have to decide right now, in this moment, how we're going to respond in those, in, those, in those moments. My dad always used to say, hey, Nathan, if you want to make the decision to save yourself until your wedding night, you've got to make the decision over the, your bowl of Cheerios, not in the moment. Because in the moment, you're going to make the wrong decision. And he was, yeah, that's a true statement. And I think the same thing is true now. In the moment, we might make the wrong decision because we get nervous and we think, I don't have the time, I don't have the money, I don't have the blah, 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 blah. Yeah, I get it. We're all busy. We all, we all have our stuff that we have to take care of. But if we have eyes out for it, if, if right now we decide, hey, God, I want to commit that the next time someone in my neighborhood has a need, I want you to see me as an answer to that need. I want you to send me as an answer to that need. Lord, next time there's someone in this church who who needs a meal, Lord, I I want you to send me as an answer to that need. Lord, I want to be an Epaphroditus in my everyday life. If you make that decision right now, instead of dreading what might be coming, you're looking for it and seeking it out. And your whole mind and heart changes. It's crazy. It's awesome. Anyway, so decide right now. Step one, decide right now. And then make that commitment before God. If you're like, hey, that's what I want to do, make that commitment before God. Say, just in your own words, you don't have to do it out loud or nothing, just say, hey, Jesus, I want to be an Epaphroditus in my neighborhood, in my world, in my community, wherever I step foot. All right, step two, keep your eyes peeled. Look for opportunities. Pay attention to what, to the, what people are going through around you. Just watch. There are so many, it's, it's amazing when you start opening your eyes and seeing everything going on around you, you're like, oh man, the opportunities are endless. In fact, I would go so far as to say there's no lack of opportunities. It's almost, so, it's almost to the point where the opportunities are so endless that they can become overwhelming and you can be like, I can't possibly serve everyone. And in that case, you're thinking a lot like Jesus. And when Jesus was faced with the overwhelming need of so many people who needed to hear about him and so just one of him, he's like, hey, I need help. So if we all decide to do this together, then the needs will be slowly, 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 slowly met. But if only one of us decides to do this, honestly, super big bummer. All right. No words for that. All right. Be wary, just as a note on on step two, be wary of thinking, I see an opportunity. Is it really from God? Listen, 
as long as it's not causing you to sin, it is from God, all right? Because God has already, Jesus already said 2,000 years ago, love your neighbors, serve the needy, feed the hungry. He already said it, so we don't have to question if it's from him or not from him. Just, just, just do it. Like, I, I feel like I say this a lot, but we as Christians, we think so much, which is great. Love thinking about God. But we need to make like Nike and just do it. You know, like, we just need to do it. Which brings me to step three. Just do it. (laughs) Seize the opportunity. And don't think about it has to be this epic big thing. Sometimes you literally being Jesus' hands and feet means just offering an encouraging word to somebody. Sometimes it means praying for them. Sometimes it means, I don't know, making them a meal. Sometimes it means, what, like, whatever. You guys know how to love people. You're all good. At, yeah, I've, all, I've felt loved by many, many of you. Almost everybody in this room i felt loved by, so I know you know how to love people. So I don't have to teach you how to do that. I would encourage you in this, though. Make the most of every opportunity, just like the scriptures say. Make the most of every opportunity. So if the opportunity allows for you to, like, preach the gospel, man, do it. Don't be afraid. Share it. If the opportunity allows for you to to share your story, do it. You'll have incredible joy, even if they reject you. I promise. I've had doors slammed in my face and gone away glad because... I shared Jesus, like, believe me, it's, it's worth it. Just make the most of every opportunity, whatever that looks like. So, this is my encouragement to you. Your ministry is the ministry that is changing the world. More than any big name evangelist, blah, 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 this and that guy, it's you who's changing the world. So, if we're willing to engage and show up, you will be amazed. You will be amazed how God will use you. You won't be disappointed. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that your kingdom would come and your will would be done in our lives and in the lives of those around us. Lord, I pray that you would empower us and equip us to, to, to just show up <laughs> just like Epaphroditus did, to just be present, to just be there. Lord, I pray against fear. Any, any sense of like, oh man, I'm going to mess it up or whatever. No, man. You, Lord, we know that you're with us. So I pray that you would eliminate fear in Jesus' name. Lord, I also pray against uh, any of the other excuses that we might come up with, I'm too busy, I'm too this, I, I'm, I don't have the money to help, this and that. Lord, I pray that you would help us to see that you're the provider. Lord, that you own the cattle on 10,000 hills. It's all yours anyway. And you'll provide for our needs, especially as we're generous with others, with our time, with our money, with, with our energy. Lord, I pray that you would send us to the places that our feet normally go, (laughs) to the people that we normally see, but that we would see the opportunity to just show up. And Father, I pray that you would bring people to us and that when you do, we would be super aware that it's you're answering our prayer that you would bring people to us, that we could love and share your good news with. Father, you're good. We praise you in your name.